Good afternoon. I'm Avalon Bristow, Program Director at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Council on the Ocean, MARCO. On behalf of the Planning Committee, I welcome you to the third and final day of the 2021 Mid-Atlantic Marine Debris Summit. This summit is made possible through a grant from NOAA's Office for Coastal Management. Sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties here. Give me one moment. I think, am I freezing up? Can the moderator, can somebody else tell me, can, can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Okay, fantastic. I'm sorry, my computer is um, deciding now is a good time to freeze. Avalon, would you like me to help you out here? Sure, Laura. Yes, I'm sorry about this. Um, I'm, if you just give me one moment, I should be able to pull up. I'm just uh, trying to figure out why my audio is crackling. Um, it sounds clear to us. Okay, fantastic. Oh, my goodness. Okay, I think I'm back up and running. Thank you for being with me there. Um, so this summit is made possible through a grant from NOAA's Office for Coastal Management, the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program. The Virginia CZM program then contracted with Marco to help with the planning and development of this summit. I would like to thank our summit planning team who have worked many long hours to make this summit happen. That's Laura McKay and Virginia Whitmer from the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program, Judy Tucker of Marco, Katie Register and Michaela Jennings of Clean Virginia Waterways of Longwood University, and the university's event and conference staff who have helped with technical aspects of this Zoom meeting and have just been invaluable partners to us. Also, Christy Kehoe from the NOAA Marine Debris Program, Matt Robinson from DC's Department of Energy and Environment, and Christy Mazeo Fortner from New York's. Department of State and Carl Vilakova from Monmouth University. Before we hear from our opening speakers, I did want to review a few housekeeping matters. Your cameras are turned off and your mics are muted, but we do ask for and appreciate your engagement. We encourage you to participate in our polls and write your questions in the Q&A box for our Q&A sessions. We will be recording this summit and that recording will be available shortly on the Mid-Atlantic uh, Regional Council on the Oceans website, which is www.midatlanticocean.org. The goal of this summit is to inspire and empower our partners in marine debris reduction. We will be hearing updates on current marine debris science and trends, and we'll explore techniques and tools that are effective in enhancing knowledge, changing behavior, and influencing policies that reduce marine debris. We are excited to be working with all of you, our, our Mid-Atlantic partners, as we explore regional efforts to reduce the sources and impacts of marine debris. I also wanted to ex extend a special thank you to all of our international participants in today's webinar. Uh, we have folks representing many different countries throughout the world, um, even India, where it is about 10 p.m. there right now. So truly, thank you so much for, for joining us today. For this final day of the summit, we're gonna learn about the issue of single-use plastics and hear about the innovative programs and solutions that folks are undertaking to tackle this pervasive and global issue. Uh, for a brief overview of today's agenda, during this first half, we're gonna learn um, specifically about single-use plastics and some of the, um, the programs and initiatives that very creative minds are undertaking to specifically address that issue. Uh, and for the second half of the summit, we'll discuss more success stories and kind of do a deeper dive into some of the, uh, the programs and methods that folks are using within communities to address not just single-use plastics, but um, marine debris more broadly and litter that might become marine debris. All right, so our first speaker of the session will be Katie Register, who is Executive Director of Clean Virginia Waterways of Longwood University. She will also serve as moderator for the remainder of this session. Hopefully her technology is working much better than mine. <laughs> Katie Register works extensively on preventing water pollution, focusing mainly on land-based sources of plastic pollution. 
She has done extensive research on ways to prevent littering, the impacts of cigarette litter, and she was part of the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program's team that designed a campaign to stop the, internet, the intentional releases of helium-filled balloons. She's consulted with the National Geographic Society, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the National Oceanic and Atmos Atmospheric Administration, Ocean Conservancy, the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program, as well as corporations. Katie has a master's degree from Miami University in biology and a master's degree from George Mason University in environmental science and public policy. Her thesis examined the environmental impacts of the number one most common type of litter on earth, cigarette butts. So it's just truly my pleasure to introduce you, Katie, and thank you so much for, for being here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Avalon. So uh, I've been asked to give a brief overview about single-use plastics. What exactly are we talking about? And uh, then I'll be introducing the other speakers and we'll have some Q&A for everybody. Uh, and I wanted to thank Coastal Zone Management Program in Virginia, as well as NOAA for support of our programs. So a little bit about sources and scope of the problem. Uh, we've heard from a lot of speakers the last two days that have talked about some of the sources. Um, and the big picture that they presented is that uh, plastic pollution is one of um, multiple stressors. Um, by multiple stressors, I'm referring to envi environmental changes that place stress on the health of the individuals, on the health of communities, on the health of an ecosystem. Uh, and multiple stressors can have the effects, um, have multiple effects that are greater than the sum caused by all the individual stresses. So like right now we're putting a lot of heat into the ocean. We're putting a lot of sound into the ocean uh, and we're putting lots of different forms of pollution including plastic pollution. Uh, so I wanted to keep this, you know, keep in mind the big picture that marine debris is um, tied to our fuel consumption of fossil fuels. It's tied to climate change um, also, it brings up questions of, you know, sustainability and overconsumption, as well as environmental justice. So that's the big picture. But the big picture is made up of a lot of little things. Uh, this list on the left shows five common littered items, marine debris items, as identified by volunteers in the International Coastal Cleanup. Uh, I took a look at the data for all the mid-Atlantic states, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, uh, along with Washington, DC. And I found that these five items, cigarette butts, bottles, caps, food wrappers, cans, are on all, all of the mid-Atlantic's top 10 list. Uh, so they're very, very, very common. And then the other items, plastic bags, straws, cups and plates made out of plastics and bottles, uh, glass bottles are on nine um, or on most of the lists of uh, the top 10. So, you know, if you take a look at this, it's a whole lot of what we're eating and drinking and of course smoking. Um, so this data is all available from the Ocean Conservancy's TIDE online database, which is open access. Anyone can go there and look at the data that's being collected worldwide uh, by volunteers as part of the International Coastal Cleanup. Uh, to go a little bit more specific, I wanna share this data with you. These are the 20 top type of debris items found by volunteers just in the state where I am, uh, Virginia. But if you may recall on the first day, uh, we heard from a speaker from New York who shared her top 10 list and it looks almost identical. So um, even though this is Virginia, it's, a, it's some very, very common stories here. And you see everything in yellow is related to what we eat and drink. So if we could eliminate littering um, and misappropriation of waste um, from just the things we eat and drink, look how different this top 10 uh, list would look like. Here's the very same list, but this time I highlighted in yellow, the items that are made out of plastic. And yes, cigarette filters are uh, a form of plastic. Those white, those white fibers are cellulose acetate. 
Um, and then in orange are items that are mostly plastic, but not entirely. For example, item 12, rope. We find a lot of rope, especially on uh, the barrier islands of Virginia, and it's almost all made out of nylons, uh, a, a form of plastic. So that's why we're concerned about plastic, whether it comes from um, people who are actively littering by throwing things out of their cars, um, mismanagement of debris, uh, illegal dumping, as you see in the bottom right, or a homeless encampment, as you see there on the left, at bottom, it's uh, uh, by a river, uh, or the intentional releasing of balloons into the air. All of these are land-based sources of debris that then travels and becomes aquatic. And more plastic is coming. Uh, plastic was new in the 1950s as single use, but now it's everywhere in our lives. This chart shows a prediction of how much more plastic production is expected if business is staying as usual. So this is a business as usual projection on new plastic production. And uh, most of this is single use, something that's made used for 10 or 15 minutes and then will last hundreds of years. So um, that bottom line, we cannot recycle our way out of this. I believe that um, recycling is part of the solution, but we cannot think that that is the only solution. A number of speakers earlier this week also shared this data uh, a study which shows the deadliest types of uh, ocean trash. And you see again, most of it is land-based sources of, um, of trash coming from land. So what are the solutions? Uh, we're gonna hear the rest of today, some case studies and some um, research that's been done on solutions. And they mostly fall into three buckets. Uh, they fall into education, which is behavior change, um, innovation, changing the way we do things so that we're producing less, weight, less waste, and then legislation. So education, innovation, legislation, all ways that we need to address um, our marine debris problems. By innovation, a, a couple of speakers earlier have also talked about circular economy. So I just wanted to share this slide, basically, what we have for the most part now is a linear economy. We make something, we use it, and we dispose of it. With a recycling economy, items get recycled a few times before they end up going into the, uh, the landfill. With a circular economy, that means we're planning ahead to reuse all of our waste. So our waste basically becomes um, raw materials for um, for other products. So who is driving the solutions? We're gonna hear from a couple of panelists in just a few minutes. The answer is all everybody. Individuals can make choices in their life and how they want to run their household and what they eat and uh, how much plastic they bring into their, their homes. Businesses, churches, uh, schools, local governments, uh, this is a all hands on deck situation. Uh, some of the ways that we're seeing people make these, these private changes, um, a lot of people have said, I'm not going to say yes to single use plastic straws. There's many campaigns out there that help people remember that um, plastic straws are not absolutely necessary for us to enjoy a drink. There's also websites including preventbloomlitter.org which offer lots of great ideas on ways to celebrate uh, without producing harmful litter and marine debris. There's ways that people can get engaged with uh, cleaning up, collecting data, recycling fishing line. So there's no matter how old you are, you can get engaged. Do we need more research about marine debris? Yes, absolutely, especially microplastics and the impact on, on not just human health, but animal health as well. Do we know though enough to take action? Absolutely, we absolutely know enough to take action through education, through innovation and through legislation. So uh, I wanted to end with this slide. We have um, plans for success. In the Mid-Atlantic, the Marine uh, Debris Action Plan 
um, recently published and the soon to be published updated Virginia Marine Debris Reduction Plan, both focus on single use plastics, derelict fishing gear, microplastics, as well as abandoned and derelict vessels. So my favorite quote, how inappropriate to call this planet Earth when clearly it is ocean. That's what motivates me and I hope it motivates you as well. So what I'd uh, like to do now is go ahead and introduce our, uh, the, our first panelist, Matt Gove. And I'm going to actually change the slide to Matt. So Matt Gove is the Mid-Atlantic Policy Manager with Surfrider. And Surfrider for, for many, many years has been very engaged on many ocean issues, including plastic pollution. He's worked for 15 years with Surfrider. He's also done work with the uh, National Oceanic, uh, and, and I'm sorry, NOAA, <laughs> as well as New York's Department of Environmental Conservation. He holds a master's degree in coastal environmental management from Duke University. Mm -hmm. And today he's gonna talk to us about the work done by Surfrider uh, working closely with restaurants. So Matt, if you'd go ahead and share your screen with us, please. All right. Okay, everything coming through? Looks great. If you, yep, just go to that mode. That looks perfect. Great. Uh, yeah, hey, I'm Matt from Surfrider and uh, I'm gonna talk about our Ocean Restaurants program. I'll also talk about, uh, we have a bunch of plastic policy toolkits. So I will uh, share those two and, and try to put some links in the chat. I don't know if I'll put the links while I'm talking or afterwards, it might be a little bit awkward, but um, uh, I live in New York and New York City, and I work uh, with our Surfrider chapters from New York down to Virginia. We have nine chapters in the region. Uh, all right, let's jump in here. For those of you who don't know a ton about Surfrider, there's, uh, there's our tag at the bottom. Basically people that love the beach. Uh, we're, we're set up, it's a little bit uh, more confusing than some groups. We have a bunch of chapters around the country. Those are all volunteers. Uh, I work for Surfrider. So that's in the Mid-Atlantic, we have nine chapters. What does Surfrider work on? Um, pretty much anything on the ocean, ocean and coast, uh, really except for fisheries. We don't work on fisheries much uh, directly, but we're in on almost everything else. It's a bunch of us at the Capitol. Um, we do a lot of beach cleanups. That's kind of the, the first level of, of activity for a, a volunteer chapter. We do about a thousand beach cleanups a year uh, across the country with our 80 chapters. And uh, recently we've, we've tried to get a lot better at collecting data from those cleanups. For years, we just did them. Um, and it's been, <laughs> it's been hard to get uh, to the data spot we are at now, but we do have pretty good data coming in. Um, and uh, if you want to check out, we, we've, for the second year in a row, we've done a, a beach cleanup report. So you can check that out. And let me see how painful is this if I stop sharing, go here, copy, paste. This isn't the prettiest thing, is it? Maybe I'll do these afterwards. Is that getting the chat? Yeah, um, I think that's a good idea. We'll add all of those to the um, chat after you speak so people can look them up. After I'm done? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a, little, that's a little awkward to cut and paste. Okay, so we have this cleanup report. You can check that out. Um, <clears throat> like I mentioned, we have a bunch of policy toolkits. Since we do have a lot of volunteers who are on the ground trying to make a difference, we, we've been trying to get them, you know, kind of one document to uh, success as far as like passing a plastic bag law in your local uh, municipality, those kinds of things. So all of those toolkits are on this landing page. Um, that's one of the things I'll share with you. Um, we have a plastic straws toolkit. This is our oldest one now, so it's a little bit outdated, but uh, we do have one for straws. And these toolkits, you know, they have like uh, pitfalls you want to, want to, want to, um, you know, <laughs> not fall into. 
um, sample language, examples from towns, cities, states that have passed these laws, uh, who to talk to. So they're, they're pretty useful for folks who want to uh, just jump in on, on plastics policy. We have a bag toolkit that's been heavily used. It seems like it's been around forever, but it's a, a few years old. Then we have an addendum to that toolkit. Um, if, if people on the call have worked on plastic bag laws and bills, um, you know, Surfrider recommends putting a fee on um, all bags and then banning plastic, single use plastic bags. That's the simplest. You just and the plastic bags and then every other kind of bag just put a fee on it so everyone doesn't just switch to paper bags uh, but a lot of times people don't want to put that fee on paper bags um, that doesn't pass uh, you know the, the, the local politics test so if you don't have that fee on all other bags then you need to define really closely what bags you're banning what single use plastic bags you're banning and so you get into how many mils thick is it a reusable bag? Uh, does it have handles? How are the handles made? So all that, uh, quite frankly, really annoying stuff is in this addendum um, if you have to go there. We also have a good list of all the states that have preemptions. Uh, preemptions have slowed down a little bit, but were really hot about five years ago where states passed at the state level uh, a law saying, okay, locals, local counties, local cities, you can no longer ban plastic bags. So it was basically a, a end round uh, maneuver to stop these plastic bag rules from going in. So we have a list of all those states. Our newest toolkit is focused on um, foodware. So this is, if you, if you wanna pass a, a, a law that says, you know, for restaurants, everything um, in the restaurant when you're eating in has to be reusable. Or restaurants when they're giving out uh, takeout food or delivery food um, don't include plastic forks and all that stuff unless the customer asks specifically. So this is our new foodware toolkit, a uh, very helpful resource. Also pretty new is this great map. You can search all um, state, local, um, EPS, foam, straws, and bag laws. So this is nice, and it's, it's not just state level, it's local too. So if you're wondering what's already been passed anywhere in the country, you can do that. And I believe the idea is we're gonna add other kind of plastic laws uh, going forward. But as you can see uh, in our region, there's a ton of things already on the ground. You can check those out. And I believe there's links to the bill language, but I'm not sure. So I'll share that link too, that's a really cool map. And here is a, just a table version of state by state for those three. Um, cigarette butt campaigns and laws, those, those were bigger like 10 years ago, but, but some places are still working on these, trying to get people, you know, smoking banned on beaches, um, things like that. We have some good, uh, some good resources and, and examples of, of campaigns to work on cigarette butts on this page. Most people know that EPR is kind of the new um, frontier in plastics policy. Uh, we do not have a toolkit, sadly. I think we're working on one, but EPR is very complicated. It's way more complicated than plastic foam or straw bills. And um, right now we just have this basic uh, one pager, but it's really nice. It just kind of gives you the basics because most people have no idea what EPR is. Okay. I'm sure this fact has been flashed on the screen a bunch over these uh, few days. That's, that's uh, why a lot of us are here. Um, and, and like I said, Surfrider does a ton of beach cleanups, but we realize you could do beach cleanups for the rest of your life and uh, you're not gonna make a huge dent. It's really, uh, we need to eliminate plastics at the source. And um, a lot of the stuff that's found is stuff that restaurants use to go food, plastic forks, knives, straws. So um, one of our chapters about almost five years ago now came up with this program uh, and started doing it locally. And we've now moved to a national program of ocean friendly restaurants. 
and we recently updated the program, tweaked it a little bit. Uh, I assume we'll do that every couple of years as as laws change. And uh, if you're keeping track, um, you know, hopefully we'll put ourselves out of business with this program by passing laws that make uh, everything in the program the rule. But for now, um, this is still a way to get to get businesses uh, to make some moves on plastics. So a few numbers. We've got um, 50 of our chapters across the country are working on this program. We've got 700 restaurants signed up. This program was basically frozen for a year and a half because restaurants were hit so hard by the pandemic. So we really are just jumping back into it in the last couple of months. This is what restaurants must do. I'll, I'll let you read that. <clears throat> So they have to do these things to be in the program. And then they get to choose three of these things. And these are uh, a lot more broad. There's composting, uh, you know, sustainable seafood, discount to use a reusable cup. So the, the, the five things they have to do are, are very plastics focused and these are a little more broad. Uh, and bioplastics, we're still just completely not messing with those. We haven't seen a product that we think is good enough to, to be used as, as a you know, sustainable product. Um, and it also, you know, if you just switch to a, a, another single use item, you're still using a single use item, right? Even if it is sustainable. So we're, we're still anti-bioplastics uh, on all levels for our, our program. So what does the restaurant get out of it? Basically they get to, you know, different, differentiate themselves from their competition put a logo in the window, put it on their website. Um, people have heard of us, so being associated with us is usually a good thing, not always. Um, they also get uh, a local shout out from the local chapter. You can see this Instagram photo over here of a restaurant uh, in New York City that got a shout out from the chapter. Um, that's big time these days. Um, and um, they like that. We also try to do events at these restaurants. If we're having like a happy hour or a meeting, we'll, we'll definitely do it at, at a little farm. So that's a big, a big uh, incentive. Every restaurant in the program gets put on this map on our national website and um, customers can search and find restaurants near them. There's some logo. Um, and this program ties back into our policy work. So if we're trying to pass a plastics bill and there's a hearing, having an ocean-friendly restaurant stand up and say, you know, hey, we switched, we switched from plastic forks three years ago and it's not a huge deal. And it's, uh, you know, the money is, is similar or we're saving money uh, using reusables. That's a powerful voice and um, that really helps us with our policy work. Um, for example, uh, in New York City, we're trying to get a uh, what we're calling skip the stuff bill passed. A similar bill has passed in LA. Basically, this would, would flip the script and um, get customers to expect to receive nothing when they get takeout and delivery food, except for the food. You know, right now you expect to get napkins, chopsticks, you know, forks, soy sauce packets, all that stuff, even if you don't want it. Even if you don't, even if you say you don't want it, you still get it, right? So we're trying to, to pass this bill that would that would flip that and mandate that you get nothing unless you ask for it. And if we can get a restaurant to stand up at a hearing and um, talk about this, that'll be very powerful. Uh, we have a toolkit for the Ocean Friendly Restaurants program. This is um, you know for our chapters to use, but people might be interested to, to take a look at that. Um, and a foodware guide, folks on this call might be more interested in that. Uh, we basically just put together a bunch of different products, their prices uh, of stuff that's better to use, reusable stuff that restaurants can buy, you know, if they're trying to go ocean friendly restaurants or, or just trying to be more sustainable. Um, it's, it's a great resource. It's got lists of, you know, different kinds of ramekins, cups, silverware, everything. That's it, rapid fire, um, lots of links to resources that I can, I can start piling into the chat 
if there, uh, I can't remember, Kay, if we're doing questions now or later, but uh, I'll start throwing those in. Thanks so Great, much. Thank you. Yeah, actually, Matt, we will be taking questions after uh, a few more speakers, and you'll all uh, be together on a panel discussion. So uh, thank you very much for sharing those, those tools with us. Um, I'd like to, at this point, introduce our next speakers. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Cindy Smith from George Mason University. She's an associate professor for environmental science and policy, and she directs the K-12 um, education for the Potomac Environmental Research and Education Center at George Mason University. She is gonna be joined by, I'm sorry, getting some feedback here. Uh, she'll be joined by three high school students, Ashley Menez, uh, who's a rising senior at Freedom High School. And uh, she's a, she said that she found that being a NOAA Marine Debris Delegate was an amazing experience and a great opportunity. She's passionate about plastic waste and water pollution. She plans on attending college, majoring in biochemistry and just declaring herself as pre-med. Uh, Stephanie Ruiz is a rising senior also at Freedom High School, where she's a scholar in the Center for Environmental and Natural Science program. She's interested in helping the community with healthier habits, and she's looking forward to majoring in biology uh, for her college degree. And then also Elizabeth Short is with us. She's a rising senior at Patriot High School. She took part in this program as a student delegate and helped with storm pond monitoring, as well as creating a uh, social media campaign to help spread awareness on her school's extreme use of plastic bottles. She's very passionate about the environment and hopes to study nursing. Um, so at this point, uh, I just wanted to share also that Dr. Smith, uh, works very hard to provide authentic experiences for people as part of her community uh, outreach. And uh, she and her marine debris community partners are changing disposable bottle use behavior with 4,000 high school students. Uh, in addition to teaching, she and her staff also deliver watershed education programs to more than 100,000 young people in Northern Virginia. So welcome, Cindy. Let me, hello, I'm going to share my screen. And thank you, Katie. Whoops. Well, I'm thrilled to, can you hear me? Yes, you're, you're yes, good. Yeah. Okay, I am thrilled to be sharing with you today. I'm up in Maine who I'm um, in a state that has just uh, initiated a ban on single use plastic bags in the grocery store that went into effect in July one. It's working beautifully and I hope everyone can do it. So Matt, thanks for that presentation. I will, I will jump right in. Project. project is a community approach, approach to reduce single use plastic, plastic bottles in two, two in in high schools in Prince William County. Um, the goal of our two year project, which we're halfway through, is to reduce the bottle use behavior in these two high schools through increased awareness of marine debris in these inland areas, as well as connecting students to where the problems are in local streams the, and the Potomac River. Um, it's, I have excellent community partners. We're working with our County Public Works Office, Keep Prince William Beautiful, our Soil and Water Conservation District, as well as the regional partner, Northern Virginia Regional Commission, and um, very strong teachers in these two high schools, one of which is Title I, one's in a more affluent area, to change behavior in 4,000 students. The framework that we're using is the one proposed by uh, Doug, whoops, Doug McKenzie Moore. It's community-based social marketing. And the general idea is it, in having direct contact with your community at the community level. You know, in this group, we all know signs don't work, literature doesn't work, telling people to stop it doesn't work. So we're trying to change behavior in a different way with these youth. 
And what we're looking at is changing the social norm in the high schools, um, making, um, making it really cool to, to not use, use a water bottle, making it really cool to pick up trash as you walk outside around the stormwater pond, making it really cool not to bring plastic water bottles to your sports practice. And um, I'm thrilled with the students we have today who are gonna share how this worked. But initially, um, we proposed to work with 10 teachers at each school and 20 student delegates, and they were going to come to our Potomac Science Center, which is on the Occoquan River, and they would work with community partners, and they would actually, like in the retention pond, they would collect plankton, see how uh, microplastics impact plankton, they would look at fish with our fisheries folks. Um, but COVID happened and no one was allowed to be in any of these spaces, nor were any of our students, most of them weren't at high school. So we had to quickly shift and we worked with our uh, GMU TV and we made a great uh, set of videos and we created a course and all the teachers took the online course as did the student delegates. And I'll share the links to some of our videos, the playlist when we're done and you can see some of what we've done. And what we then did is all of the student delegates went through the training and you can see our community-based social marketing framework had these different steps where, where initially um, and, and the students are you what ha happened the data, data and through these very very different steps. but what i want to do is step away right. so that they can share with you what they found out when they did their research Hi guys, hey guys, I'm Elizabeth. Um, I'm a rising senior at Patriot High School in Noakesville. So we did a survey through our science classes. So about a fifth of the of the two schools were studied, and we found that we use over ten thousand bottles per week, which is a lot for four thousand, five thousand students for uh, between these two high schools. Um, we found that two thirds of students use bottles every single day. So whether it be a weekday or a weekend, and it's about, yeah, it's about 10,000 bottles a week, which is fifth, over 150,000 bottles per week throughout our entire county, which is a ton. Um, there are 52 weeks in a year, so imagine the amount between the entire year. Um, next slide. Oops. And so unsurprisingly, the most used type of bottle is water. Um, I know a lot of like my friends on sports teams and stuff all use plastic water bottles as much as I tell them not to, but we found that the probably the most surprising piece of information that we found was that two was that a quarter of students don't own a reusable water bottle, which I feel like now most people give away water bottles for free I know that's part of our project was to give away the water bottle. So it was really surprising to find that a, four, a quarter of the students didn't have reusable water bottles at home. Um, hello, and I'm Stephanie, and I'm just wanting to speak on how we could reach our peers, just like Elizabeth was talking about how much water bottles were being used almost on a daily basis. I was thinking a way to reach our peers since now everybody uses uh, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter. I was um, <clears throat> predicting that we should go on TikTok and join these comedy challenges that most of our peers do, and by participating in these challenges, we could get more of the community to share our videos and be more aware of the situation. And by sharing these uh, community videos, I've noticed that when I participated like in the Garfield recycling, um, most of my peers helped me repost and I ended up getting almost 20 comments from just friends and then my friends would repost it on their pages. And it really did show how the community community could help us um, reach our goal. And yeah, yeah. Next slide. Next. Isn't that you? And I'll just introduce really quickly, when we worked with our county public works office, Tim Hughes, who's an environmental engineer, he came out to the school and he brought stormwater maps to show exactly how drainage worked and where trash blows from and um, where it ends up, all of our schools eventually feed into some of the local streams. And the students participated in this and can talk about, you know, how this authentic experience went for them.
So at Patriot Art, um, our school goes into two different ponds. And so it was, we went and saw one of them and this one was closer to the elementary school. And we found a lot of like tennis balls and lacrosse balls, which is surprising because our tennis courts are super far away from the stormwater pond. They're like in the back of the campus. And also as a tennis player, I was like, ooh, it was really disappointing to see that we had let so many of our equipment drain into the pond. Like we could have used that equipment. And also it was polluting the stormwater. So our pond at Freedom X School was surprisingly clean. And I'm assuming it's because many kids weren't really at school due to COVID and all. And it was shocking to see how clean it was. And we tested it at different levels and everything. Yeah, yeah, and Freedom actually has over uh, 78 acres, I believe. And for how reasonably clean it was, I think that's how it should be all the time, even with or without COVID. But since COVID was um, happening and we did have um, some football games, there was still a lot of water bottles on like football fields. But I think that should be more like of a priority seeing to clean after our games. Um, another component that was part of our project is that um, our, in my fisheries lab with my researchers, um, they look at ichthyoplankton samples, you know, up and down the Potomac River, but Neabsco Creek has never been sampled. And this creek drains um, one of the high schools upstream. And so students and some of the teachers came out on a torrentially downpouring day with our fisheries grad students to collect samples to see if indeed there are eggs or um, little hatchlings of river herring, which come from the Chesapeake Bay out you know, in the Atlantic and they move up if they're breeding. If indeed we find those this, spring, this fall, students will be analyzing the samples at their high school, find out well, whether indeed river herring are, are present and, and we're not looking at that connection in this project, but whether you know the assumption is that microplastics from these bottles upstream could potentially be harming them. So that's another neat um, experience they'll have coming up. Um, the, in the framework that we used, and the students can talk about how this is gonna work in the spring, is that they looked at the barriers, they looked at benefits, and then they chose their tools. And one of the tools, well, one of the problems they found out is that these high schools did not have bottle fillers. So if you don't have a bottle filler, it does make it a challenge. So this summer, each high school is getting two, I think one's even getting four, I could be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, bottle fillers added, which I think will make a difference. But we also want the kids to make a public pledge um, that they won't bring water bottles to school. And in exchange, they'll get one of these water bottles. And this they'll be working on this spring. And do you wanna, yes, see, and Elizabeth has one. Have you handed any of those out yet? Uh, yeah, we did them to all the spring sports teams. So um, lacrosse, girls soccer, boys soccer, tennis, and outdoor track all were able to choose if they wanted water bottles or stickers. And were the pledges, I mean, it was a challenge in COVID. You couldn't really pledge as pledges on the wall. Who would see them, see them. But part of CBS, CBS and work is to make it, to make it your pledge public, public. As we move forth, um, what's next in the program that the students will be working on is they're gonna analyze the ichthyoplankton samples. They are gonna collect all the data, um, you know, looking at did bottle use behavior change? They'll repeat those surveys. And um, we'll be reporting back to NOAA as well as to you guys. And the bottle fillers will be installed. As you can see in COVID, it was great that they had them, but you couldn't use water fountains when the kids went back to school. Um, we also have one other component I didn't add that I will add is that we had high school students partnered with our environmental toxicology students at George Mason, and they have put together um, a video series to help teach the community about um, how plastics and microplastics do impact aquatic life. We anticipating those coming out um, possibly end of August or into the fall semester. And we will take any questions that you have later on during the panel. Thank you. And thank you, Noah. Great, thank you all. That was very interesting. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions for you and we uh, bring you back in a few minutes uh, as part of our panel. At this point, 
introduce our next speaker, Dr. Rita Butler. She was born and raised in uh, Homer, Alaska, and she earned her undergraduate degree. Oh, sorry. She earned her um, undergraduate degree at uh, the College of um, Lewis and Clark in biology, and then later a PhD in environmental science at Portland State University, both located in Portland, Oregon. She's worked in numerous fisheries and marine conservation roles, uh, including shellfish fishery manager and um, working on protected marine areas. Um, she, she's just done all kinds of wonderful things from the ocean and taking care of the life of the ocean. She is very interested in the intersection of plastic pollution, fisheries, and fishing communities. Um, her, in fact, her doctorate work focused on determining the ecological and social dimensions of microplastics in the Pacific Northwest shellfish. Uh, she's worked with the Ocean Conservancy as a senior manager of ocean plastics research, and she's now working to develop a plas or a policy relevant ocean plastic research agenda uh, and continue um, to contribute insights into the growing body of scientific literature about ocean plastics. Uh, so we're very happy to have you with us. If you would please share your screen. All right, thank you, Katie. Hopefully this screen sharing works. Um, aha. Okay, thank you everybody. It's nice to be here today. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, pandemic pollution. So my title, the title of my presentation is Pandemic Pollution, the Rising Tide of Plastic PPE. So looking at this beautiful picture of the ocean here um, is a great reminder that our health and our ocean's health are inextricably connected. Uh, the story of pandemic generated pollution I'll be talking about today is an illustration of how closely linked we are to our environment and how our actions we take on land have lasting impacts even on far flung corners of the ocean. So the latest uh, information tells us that about 11 million metric tons of plastics enter our ocean every day. This is the weight equivalent of about uh, over three Eiffel Towers entering the ocean on a daily basis. And even with current reduction commitments, uh, it's estimated that a cargo ship's worth of plastics will enter aquatic ecosystems every single day by 2030. When these plastics enter aquatic environments, in this case, the ocean, they're subjected to all these different physical forces we have UV from sunlight, salt, wave action, microbial degradation, wind, et cetera. And as you all know, these macroplastics degrade into microplastics. And these macro and micro and nano and mesoplastics all together um, in our oceans are circulating in gyres, ending up on coastlines. And this is not an uncommon sight to see, um, even on remote islands. So at Ocean Conservancy, uh, for most of our history as an organization, the backbone of our Trash Free Seas program and what we are probably best known for is our annual International Coastal Cleanup. Um, it's been running for about 35 years. So since the mid 80s, we have mobilized millions of people to collect hundreds of millions of pounds of trash from beaches and waterways around the world. And this is to try to tackle that plastic pollution issue. Here are some of our happy volunteers because they have uh, effectively cleaned up a beautiful beach. So this is data from our, our 2020 International Coastal Cleanup event. This shows the top 10 items that we, that we collected and our, our volunteers and coordinators have collected. And just peering down that list of top 10 items, uh, what stands out to me is all of them are made of plastics. So the top, the top item collected were food wrappers, followed by cigarette butts, beverage bottles, etc. cetera. Um, again, all plastics and most of them single use. This is data now specifically for your region. Uh, looking at the top, top 10 items collected in 2020, it's a similar list, though cigarette butts are number one 
uh, followed by food wrappers, plastic bottles, et cetera. Again, largely plastics, largely single use. So we have this plastic pollution problem. We have volunteers working to clean it up. Um, but as of 2019, we have this sort of new type of pollution because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and the pandemic has really laid bare our over-reliance on unnecessary single-use plastics, as well as how our waste management systems are really struggling to keep up with it all. So a lot of places around the US have had to either reduce or shut down their curbside pickup of recyclables, for example, which is precisely at a time when plastics are piling up in our homes more than ever. And to illustrate that, um, a study just came out a few months ago showing that food delivery has grown up to 36% during the pandemic, increasing our food packaging use here in the US by 15% which obviously is going to burden our waste management system. But aside from the plastics we're using in our everyday lives, again, we also have this new uh, category of equipment that's being used called PPE. Um, as we all know, these are wearable items that are meant to protect us from, from COVID-19 transmission. They've been very important and effective in doing so. Um, they can be these, these different face masks, gloves, face shields, et cetera. And they're typically either disposable, single use, or can be reusable. But far and away, disposable PPE are made of plastic. So example, uh, this face mask here, uh, disposable face masks are mostly made of woven polypropylene. They can also contain other polymer types, polystyrene, polycarbonate, uh, polyethylene or polyester. Uh, and during the pandemic, it's estimated that 3 million of these have been used around the world every single minute. In terms of gloves, these are also plastics. They're typically comprised of latex, vinyl, nitrile, or other polymers. And then your face shields and surgical gowns are also typically very plastic based. So not only are these items plastic, but we're using them on a very large scale. Um, about 200 billion items of PPE have been used monthly during the pandemic around the world. Most of those are disposable. Uh, disposable PPE are not recyclable. And prior to the pandemic, uh, the growth in PPE was about 5% every single year. But we're now expecting that to quadruple to 20% every year. Uh, from 2020 to 2025, and it's possible that that will continue uh, moving forward. So because of the widespread use, unfortunately, um, many of these items are being released into the environment inadvertently. They're reaching our shorelines and our ocean. So at Ocean Conservancy, we want to kind of wanted to kind of dig into the issue and do our best to, to characterize the issue. Um, so in March of this year, we released this pandemic pollution report, which I'll share a link to later. It's, it's open access for everyone. Um, but in that report, we had two main data sources that we were looking at. We looked at our um, international coastal cleanup data, which is housed in our CleanSwell app. Anyone can download that um, or was written on data cards. And then we also sent out a survey to our International Coastal Cleanup volunteers and coordinators to get a better issue, um, idea of PPE issues they were facing in their local communities. So in terms of what we found, um, over 107,000 items of PPE were logged in six months during our 2020 ICC event. Um, we didn't have as large of a turnout last year because of the pandemic, as we typically do in an ICC year. Uh, so this is really a, a vast underestimate of what is likely out there. Had we had typical turnout, we estimate that this number would, would be more in the low millions. This is just kind of a snapshot of, of the number of people that reported PPE and how much PPE was collected. So in this uh, global snapshot here, the color of the state or country represents how many volunteers logged PPE. And then the amount of PPE collected is in that yellow to red color. Um, so zooming in on your region, 
uh, looking at New York, for example, we had between five and 10,000 people logging, logging data. And they reported about 5, 000, one to 5,000 pieces of PPE during our uh, international coastal cleanup last year. In terms of the survey we administered, again, we just wanted to get a sense of what people were seeing uh, qualitatively. So we asked coordinators and volunteers, did you see PPE at a cleanup in 2020? The vast majority, 94% said yes. Um, we asked how often do you see PPE in your community? Um, unfortunately, over 50% said daily. We asked where did you observe PPE during a cleanup? 94% um, said they saw it on land, which makes sense. That's where most people are conducting cleanups. Uh, but 37% reported that they saw it in the water. So in any aquatic ecosystems, streams, rivers, or oceans. And then what was the most common type of PPE you encountered? 81% said face masks. And the next most common were gloves. And these are just a couple of quotes from uh, organizers of ICC from the UK and Florida, illustrating that PPE is really becoming more prevalent in what these coordinators who have done this for a number of years um, are seeing and logging in their CleanSwell app. So key findings from the report, uh, PPE was collected in 70 of 115 participating countries. We logged over 107,000 pieces. 94% um, had found PPE at one of their cleanups. 40% had found five or more PPE items at one single cleanup, and only 2% didn't see any at all. And then last, nearly 50% of those surveyed uh, reported that the vast majority, over 75% of the PPE they saw was single use or disposable. So that's kind of characterizing the PPE macroplastic issue, uh, but we know that there's also a closely related microplastic issue. Um, it's estimated that up to 400,000 tons of pandemic related face masks could end up in the ocean within one year. Uh, we know one face mask can shed over 173,000 microfibers per day. And if that face mask is in the environment and it's weathering, uh, it can cumulatively release several billion microfibers into the environment over time. And as we know, microplastics don't just stay in one, one environmental compartment, they move from one to the other in this sort of global microplastic cycle. So if a face mask were to unfortunately end up in the ocean, that doesn't mean the microplastics will stay there. They can enter the atmosphere, they can fall to the ground, be taken up by biota, enter the water system or be um, inhaled by humans or taken up through foods that humans consume. So there have been a couple of estimates out there about uh, human adult microplastic exposure. Um, a couple of those were related to consumption of bivalves only. Um, one estimate was that people that consume bivalves in Europe are exposed to 11,000 microplastics per year. Um, in China, that's an order of magnitude higher. Um, but there was a study that came out recently, um, earlier this year, that looking across eight different categories of consumables for people, that's seafood, water, beer, salt, um, and the air we take in, um, adults you typically will take in about 300,000 microplastics each year. Um, but that keeping in mind, we don't know um, microplastic content for all of the foods we eat. So that's likely an underestimate. And we also don't know what that means for um, human health risk. So to get at that risk question, this is just an example of some research we're doing at Ocean Conservancy. We're looking at microplastics and commonly consumed aquatic and terrestrial proteins, as well as their plant-based analogs, to try to fill some of those gaps about what we don't know about microplastics in, for example, beef or chicken or things we, we use in our diet. Um, pretty consistently, but we just don't know. Um, so we're trying to fill that gap to help get at human health risk from microplastic exposure. So the, we know about the issue now, uh, but we also know it's really important to take action. So here are a couple of recommendations we put forth in our report 
uh, for governments and individuals. Uh -oh. Okay, great. So for federal government, this is for plastics kind of in general. We ask that they work to implement legislation like the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, which is working to address the full life cycle of plastics. And then in terms of funding, uh, we're requesting that, that funding is directed to phase out procurement of unnecessary single-use plastics within the federal system. Similarly, funding should be directed to marginalized, underserved, and vulnerable communities that are disproportionately affected by the plastics um, production or the entire life cycle. And then providing funding for research and to address PPE management and, and other plastic waste management challenges and cleanups as well. For state governments, we're also asking them to pass policies that phase out those single-use plastics you saw in our ICC top 10 list that are also difficult or impossible to recycle. Um, we're asking for extended producer responsibility programs so that the private sector is actually taking responsibility for the products they're producing. Um, and then establishment of recycled content standards so that we actually have a demand and a market for recycled plastics. For individuals, in terms of PPE specifically, a couple of things you can do to help the, the problem are to snip ear loops off of your face masks before you dispose of them. Um, that can help reduce the entanglement likelihood if they do, for some reason, enter the environment. Um, also making sure that if you throw them away, that you do so in a covered, secured trash bin so that they don't blow out uh, onto the coast or shoreline. But more broadly, in terms of your day-to-day -day life, um, all of the other speakers have hit on these, but these are just suggestions as to how you can reduce your overall plastic footprint, ranging from your reusables, like we just saw in that great presentation, to choosing plastic-free packaging or using your voice to contact companies that are using too much plastic in their products um, or contacting your representatives to make your opinion known. And then in terms of cleanups, Last couple of slides, um, this is really important. This is how we get our data to characterize what types of items are out in the environment. Uh, you can visit wecleanon.org to learn more about our international coastal cleanup and safe ways to be, be conducting these cleanups during pandemic times. And then lastly, um, when you are conducting cleanups and logging it into our app, you're really helping us track these new emerging categories of plastic pollution like PPE. Um, this is a new category in our app as of last year. We will be maintaining it in our app you know, in perpetuity so we can track the prevalence of PPE in the environment, which is really important. It helps inform the science, which ultimately helps inform policy. And that is all I have. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Britta. That's just tons of great information. Um, and actually, while we have you uh, and while we're waiting for the other speakers to uh, turn their videos back on uh, to join us for uh, a panel discussion, I thought I'd start with you, Britta, and ask if you could go in a little bit more detail about extended producer responsibility and what can a state do? I mean, I know this is on your state list. This. Uh, but can you get some, uh, give us some specifics on what a state could legislate to make producers more responsible. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I'll just be honest up front. Um, I sit on the science side of the house um, and, and our job is to sort of feed the current science into our uh, government relations folks and help develop policies. So I'm not specifically an EPR expert. Um, but we do have something called the, the Plastics Policy Playbook, which Ocean Conservancy put out recently, which really details what different options are for EPR and how different um, levels of government could potentially implement those. So a bit of a non-answer, but we do have great resources for that. <laughs> Oops, and I think you're on mute, Katie. Thank you. Um, perhaps you could put a link to that resource so that we can share it with everybody. Uh, and Matt, did you have anything to 
add about specifically what states could do to increase producer responsibility when it comes to plastic packaging or plastic items? Yeah, I mean, I shared that EPR one pager, which is, is kind of the basic 101, um, and three or four states this year did try to pass an EPR bill. Uh, the only one that got to the finish line was Maine, and I can, I can share a blog about that bill, which we think is pretty good. But um, I mean, basically you just, you just try to uh, switch the, the responsibility over to companies that make plastic packaging, like all the extra stuff you get in the grocery store, you know, all those satchels and, and weird things that aren't recyclable. You know, basically EPR is trying to clean up all the stuff that, that, that we have after we get through, you know, we've already banned styrofoam, we've already banned plastic bags in a lot of places. Um, it's all that other stuff. And so moving the financial burden over to companies uh, to recycle that stuff uh, and even better um, recycle it or eliminate it altogether or make a product that's easier to recycle and less toxic. Um, those are really the goals of EPR, but it's, uh, it's very tricky to get it right. Great, thank you. Yeah, I noticed too that you use the word satchel, which is a word that uh, people may not be familiar with, uh, but basically we're talking about single use packaging, like a, a satchel of ketchup or soy sauce. Um, sometimes people buy water flavor satchels that they can then put in their water bottle to make it taste like lemonade. Uh, in some countries, satchels of shampoo and conditioner and dish soap and laundry soap are, are used a lot. Um, Britta or Matt, I don't know if you wanted to talk anything more about satchels. <laughs> That's a, a new and uh, growing issue. Yeah, and not to be confused with, with sachets, which <laughs> are another type of plastic, which are often filled with water um, and used in either emergency situations or in places where there's not great clean water infrastructure or access. So nothing to add there, but <laughs> another piece of lingo. Yes, right, right. Yeah, we learn a lot through this process. Um, I wanted to ask too about the international coastal cleanup data. Uh, as you pointed out, the number of volunteers in 2020 was reduced. Here in Virginia, we had about one third as many volunteers as, as in a normal year. But did you find that the top 10 debris items differed much from 2019, which was a normal year to 2020. Uh, was there some kind of difference that you found in the top 10? No, um, there actually wasn't much of a difference at all. Um, you know, typically cigarette butts have been number one on, on the, the top of our uh, top 10 items collected through ICC. Food wrappers are now at number one, which is um, alarming and something we need to be working on in terms of policies and you know, hopefully having that extended producer responsibility piece. Um, the only other thing to flag is that our other trash category um, sort of was elevated and that's probably because folks started logging PPE in that category before we were able to implement that new um, PPE specific item in our application. But for the most part, status quo for the single use plastic items that are way too commonly found on our beaches. Great. Um, we also had a question for you again uh, about microfibers. One question was, how do you know how many microfibers can come off of a mask, a single use um, disposable PPE mask? And the other was, how do you test for microfibers in protein, in, in meat or shrimp or hamburgers? Those are great questions. So in terms of how do you know the shedding rates, um, the, that figure came from a paper that was published earlier this year in which the researchers essentially took a um, disposable mask, simulated weathering in a laboratory environment um, and swished it around in water of different salinities to be able to simulate you know, if, if a mask were floating out in the water, et cetera. They then take uh, the water surrounding the mask itself, filter it, and are able to count the number of microfibers in that water to get at that shedding rate, um, if you will. 
And in terms of how do you test the number of microplastics in different proteins or different environmental media, luckily that body of research is pretty solid and there have been some incredibly effective methods developed to do that. Um, that's what I did for my dissertation work, looking at microplastics in oyster and razor clam tissues. But essentially it's this process where you, um, there are different options, but essentially you chemically digest the tissue using a strong base or strong acid that then leaves a liquid, which you also filter onto either a filter paper or into a small dish, which you pass under a microscope and you're able to visually count um, how many fibers or fragments, films, et cetera. You can measure them under the microscope as well. Uh, but then a really important step that's sort of come to light recently is that you also have to chemically identify those suspected microplastics to make sure that they are indeed polymers because sometimes a fragment looks like it might be plastic, but it's actually a piece of shell. So in order to be able to report the most accurate counts in whatever media you're looking at, you need to do some sort of chemical characterization, um, which requires expensive equipment. Great. Yeah, I know it got a lot of publicity a few years ago when microfibers were found in beer and salt, because um, that's going to impact people's health long term. So yeah, and I was disappointed when when they tested wine as well and found oh, um, microfibers as well. Well, thank you for that information. Um, we have a few questions now for uh, Dr. Cindy Smith and her students about engaging youth and what is the most effective way to engage youth in these issues and make them care uh, about spending time to decrease marine debris. Uh, Cindy, you're on mute. Um, I'll start first, but I like the students to respond as well. Uh, one thing that we've seen that's been very effective is if you can get people out to a cleanup and they actually see the shock and awe of the sheer volume of plastics. And then every time you have a plastic bottle, you've got that memory. Uh, we didn't get to do a lot of that in COVID because we couldn't, that was part of our project, but we hopefully will this fall. But um, that's my thoughts. But what do you high school students think? Honestly, I agree. Just kind of like scaring us, scaring us a little bit so that we're kind of more shocked about what our, uh, what we're doing has, what, what we're doing impact on the planet. I'm sorry, could you get to the microphone? We cannot hear you very well. So I was able to attend the sampling collection we did a few months back, and it was interesting to see how much debris we found. Um, there were glass bottles, plastic bottles, and I was even shocked to find soccer balls there. And it's just interesting how careless some people can be towards our environment. Well, someone's just written a question. I was wondering if the students saw anything that stood out or made an impact on them while sampling, besides maybe the soccer ball that you just mentioned. Uh, he goes on to say, I think it's great that you were exposed to so many hand-on experiences. So um, yeah, what, did you, what else did you find that was surprising or shocking or disgusting? Um, I got to wear chest waders for the first time. So that was very fun and exciting. I was again, like able to have a hands-on experience, which I really loved because I feel like I learn better when I'm actually involved in things. So that was very fun. And I'm glad I got to go that day. For things I found, we found like a bone, like a fox bone, um, a bunch of tennis balls and lacrosse balls. But I think the like nastiest I guess well not like nastiest but like nastiest to the environment thing we found was like a bunch of like Gatorade or like sports drink bottles because those have like the sugar inside of them too which is dangerous to wildlife and it was just like surreal to see the amount of plastic bottles that had made their way into the like little pond thing because it wasn't very big it was pretty small One of the things that I see when I run watershed education programs at a um, park in Springfield, Virginia, and there's a big retention pond and many, many, many storm drains feed into it, 
is that every time the kids come up there and they see the dock and they see all this floating debris, they're like, why don't they clean this up? Is usually the first comment, whoever they is. And then they look more carefully and they see turtles and frogs sitting on top of tennis balls and other components and duckweed growing in it. And once they learn that that is one storm's worth, which is about a full dumpster worth of debris, they're like, oh, and that just came off the roads. And we're like, yep. And it's a daily occurrence in that particular uh, aquatic area. And we're only seeing what floats. The, what also is always amazing is what sunk. There's way more. Great. Did you, um, during the work with the 4,000 students, did you run into some barriers? Did you run into some students who didn't believe this was an issue? Or they did not believe that they could do something about it? What did you guys think when you did your barrier survey? Like, wasn't there some of them who were like, well, what's the big deal? Yes, I'll go. I'll go. Um, there were a ton of like people that were like, what's the big deal about plastic bottles? Like my one plastic bottle isn't going to do anything to the like environment. But it was like your one plastic bottle every day for 365 days, like that's 365 plastic bottles um, every year. And you, if you live for your four years of high school, that's over a thousand bottles. And it's just like, I don't understand how people can not see that it exists. Yes, and also many people sometimes say like, oh, I forgot my water bottle at home and just find it easy to like use and it affects. So forgetting to bring it, that's like me with my shopping bags once in a while, you leave them in the car. Um, another question was uh, about the international coastal cleanup database, the data that are collected by volunteers worldwide. Uh, somebody wanted to know if a local community or local government could access that data to see what their top litter items are. So I guess that's a question for you, Britta. Yeah, so that is all housed in our TIDES database. I put the URL for that into my response to whoever asked that awesome question. I think it was Veronica. It's coastalcleanupdata.org. Um, but, but if anyone wants to pull specific pieces of data in particular, we have staff at Ocean Conservancy um, within the International Coastal Cleanup Program that um, are able to do that and help you navigate and, and understand the nuances of the data. Um, so I put Sarah Kalar's email address, uh, skalar at oceanconservancy.org. They could um, contact her directly if that was of interest as well. Yeah, I'm gonna try too to share my screen real quickly just to show what we're talking about with the TIDES database. Um, we at Clean Virginia Waterways use it uh, several times a week. Uh, sometimes a local government will contact us and say, you know, our plastic bag's a big issue with us. Uh, for example, in Virginia, um, local governments have just been given, well, over a year ago, they were given the ability to put a five cent fee on single use plastic bags. And as communities are looking at that, they're calling and saying, can you know, do you have any data about that? And I always tell them anyone can go on. So this is the TIDES uh, website. And if you want to report, you go to view reports, you pick the dates that you want to look at. We'll just leave it at the default, which is the last 12 months, but you can choose any of these years if you wish. Um, and then you drill down now I haven't logged in, so hopefully this will uh, allow me to get some kind of report. Uh, sometimes you do have to make an account, but it's free. So, you know, like I say, this is an open access data. So there we go. We've, uh, in the last 12 months, there's been 1400 data points. Uh, and this, you know, that's a lot of uh, data that's coming in either with the paper form that people fill out or uh, the smartphone app, which is called CleanSwell. So as you get further down, you can see that you could pull a report for Delaware, DC, any of the states that show up, uh, but this is also international. And as we're getting down into Virginia, 
here, you'll see that um, we'll be able, once we sign in, we'll be able to get them by the county. So Britta, what did I miss? <laughs> you are doing great. You're excellent at navigating. Yeah, so, so using this um, TIDES database, you should be able to pull out basic information, uh, you know, the number of people, the weight of debris that was collected, uh, the distance that folks were cleaning up, et cetera. But for more, more specifics, definitely contact us. We're always happy to provide this great data that folks are working to collect every day. All right, for example, I, I just clicked on Delaware. Uh, oh, I have to log in in order to get the report. But again, it's free to have a, a, an account. Uh, and this is international, so it's really fun. Students can compare their county litter compared to the state, or they can compare their state to what's being found in England uh, or Germany. Uh, so it's, it's a really very robust database. And we encourage everyone to participate in collecting data by using Clean Swell. Um, all right, let me see what other questions we have. Yeah, Matt, uh, I guess another question for you is about um, as you work with restaurants, uh, again, the question of barriers, uh, do you find some restaurants are not willing to join your program? And if so, what are the barriers? Is it expense or is it um, perceptions or any insights there? Yeah. Um can you hear me? I don't see my yes. video anymore. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, some restaurants, you know, I, I spoke to a, a restaurant last year before the, the pandemic that was doing everything except for their issue was in the summer, they get huge crowds outside and they can't keep up with the dishwashing and they're worried about glass breaking. So they use, uh, single-use cups outside um, and so they were just trying to figure out what they could do and so there's some restaurants are like that some are concerned about being able to get the products you know usually they get all of their materials from one company because that's cheaper and easier for them and so we say oh hey look at look at this product it's similar priced and it's reusable or it's or it's made of something better and they say, well, now I have to order from two companies and I'm going to be paying more and it's going to be more complicated. So I think it's a, a supply chain. Um, some things there are costs. Like if you notice, we still allow restaurants to use takeaway food uh, boxes that are made of single use plastics because some of that takeaway materials are significantly more expensive or they still have PFAS in them anyway. So that's one area where we did, you know, we're not forcing them to, to go um, to something even better for takeaway food. So there's definitely some hurdles, um, but as I said, hopefully we're gonna put ourselves out of business by passing these laws. Um, you know, uh, when the program first started, it was just straws on request was the rule. And now it's paper straws on request because paper straws are so much more ubiquitous and the price has gone down. And so hopefully it'll just be a slow ratcheting of the program. Great, thank you. Um, another question was, um, at what level should we be trying to affect this change? Uh, I know the, the schools, um, Dr. Smith and her students were working on a community level, individual level you know, getting individuals to change their behavior. And Matt, you're working on a uh, one level up, not so much working to get consumers to change their behavior, but the restaurants that are serving uh, the consumers. Uh, and then it sounds like um, uh, Britta, your OSHA Conservancy is working on an even higher level, encouraging state and federal laws and all. So I'd like to hear all of you talk about which level do you think is most effective given resources are always scarce um, or are they all effective? So I'm, I'm gonna ask Dr. Smith to go first with that question. 
Uh, I think they're all effective, but um, I think people have to experience it to know there's a problem. You know, like um, I've been to the grocery store this week up in Maine. There are absolutely no plastic bags available. And I have to pay five cents for every paper bag. So now you feel it and you see it. What was interesting is I asked the people at the register, do they know why? I don't know. It's driving me crazy. This is hard. I'm like, it's nice that Maine put the ban in, but the employees felt like there, there should have been some training about telling why it's so, it's so great. And look what, look what you're saying, you know, you know, Maine had these coastal, coastal resource. So, so I could on the, any individual think they need to, need to experience, but I think, I think the thing that you guys are doing, are doing is terrific. Yeah, I can, I can hop in next. Um, for, for us, I think we think it's important to focus upstream when it comes to, to tackling plastic pollution um, in some ways. That includes, uh, you know, petrochemical companies, plastics producers, and corporations that are making the products in order to achieve an actual full transformation of our plastic system. Um, though calling for individual action is really important as well. Um, that can, you know, having folks participate in cleanups or be more mindful of purchases can be quite empowering and can lead to broader environmental advocacy. So, you know, it's important on all levels, definitely. But I think in order to really get at this root transformation, which is required to curb that, uh, you know, the amount of plastics entering the ocean by 2030, for example, we're going to have to focus as far upstream as possible, as with as is the case with lots of different types of, of pollution. And the uh, students, Stephanie, Ashley, Elizabeth, um, what, what do you think about what is the the level of reaching out to people? Should it be done on the school level? Uh, through laws, what do you think will be most effective? Um, I think laws yeah. are more effective since, like you know, they can be enforced and laws can like have hold penalties towards people who like don't follow the laws. Yeah, that's pretty much what I believe too. Uh, it'll just it'll just bring more awareness to everything because if you just tell somebody to pick up the trash, they won't do it. But if there's like a sign there that says, you know, pick up your trash with like, you know, the police are going to be coming. That's a whole different situation. <laughs> I think you need a little bit of everything, because I think if you just have the like federal laws and the state laws, like it's not going to people break laws all the time. So they're not going to like specifically listen if they maybe they'll like slip up every once in a while. But I think if you go person to person in and have these laws then you're able to kind of influence how people think more. And so they'll know the reason why, and then they'll be less likely to kind of skate by the laws, so. Any other thoughts on that? All right, well, the next question that we have from somebody is, uh, I, I think probably for Matt and maybe Britta, what do you do when a community is looking at passing a law that would either ban the use of plastic bags or put a fee on them, but there's uh, resistance from some industries, uh, perhaps grocery stores or the plastic bag industry. Uh, what advice would you have for communities uh, that are facing opposition? Well, I, I'll just go, uh, uh, Britta mentioned this earlier, but um, the data is so important. That's one piece. And that's why we have gotten better at our data because we then just point you know to that and say well we were just out and we just picked up 20 plastic bags so you know there's definitely a problem here um that's kind of step one uh then you also need to get uh as many people on your side so that's another reason i mentioned having ofrs ocean friendly restaurants step up and 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 say hey this is not a big deal we can pass this that that kind of shuts down people who use the argument that oh this this law is going to decimate businesses um, and then this ties into a question uh, um, that Cindy, Cindy asked, um, who's against the laws? And, and obviously the you know, big plastic, the American Chemistry Council, 
companies that are making plastic bags are obviously against a plastic bag law, but uh, you also have to be careful if you don't get that fee on paper, uh, paper bags, then we've seen that customers will switch to paper bags. Okay, that's not good, but that is also not good for the grocery stores and they have associations uh, because they are gonna pay more because paper bags are five times as expensive as a plastic bag, I think. Um, and they don't wanna charge for a paper bag. So they're gonna end up eating the cost of giving out all those paper bags. So we've seen if a, if a bill loses that fee on paper, then suddenly the grocery stores who are supporting the bill uh, will suddenly switch and be against it. Um, so you gotta get your, you know, as many people on your side as possible, business voices and, and the data. Great, and on a related question, somebody's asked if uh, Surfrider or Ocean Conservancy have um, worked at all with the food delivery businesses, you know, Grubhub and uh, the other groups that deliver food to talk to them about their use of plastic, pre preferably, you know, plastic bags and other disposables. I'll hop in first. Um, I, I don't know that there are any, any specific campaigns to reach out to them at the moment, um, but we did just deploy a national panel survey to, to individuals across the US to get a better sense of um, how they were using um, food delivery and takeout during the pandemic and which specific services they were using uh, what types of utensils, et cetera. So we have a lot of data now looking at that specifically, which we'll be writing up into a report soon. And I have a feeling that that's going to be informing our actions and uh, communications with um, both members of the public and these types of food delivery services moving forward. Um, we, Surfire doesn't usually work directly with companies like that, but we did, um, put together a national letter to all the big uh, food delivery apps. We got about hundred groups to sign on. Uh, we heard very little back. We had maybe one meeting. It was, it was hard to get in with them. And um, I think part of that is a lot of them are being bought up by each other. At least last year, there was like three or four acquisitions. Um, but I also think they, they don't want to talk about it. There is a group in California that's just focused on this. And as soon as I remember their name, I'll put it in the chat. Thank you. Um, the next question actually goes back to Dr. Smith about community-based social marketing. And I know we have a speaker this afternoon who will be talking more about community-based social marketing, but uh, I was wondering if you could reflect on how much research has to be done or how much research was done with your study before you started implementing solutions. Um, Cindy, you're, you're on mute again. Yeah, I hope my mic is better now. Sounds good, yes, thank you. Okay. Um, we as a group did a fair amount of research, but what we did is we had the teachers and the students look into campaigns that were effective, that weren't effective, um, what has worked. Um, I did this like a year ago, so I can't remember which campaigns we reviewed, but we looked at a number of them, but then we passed it down to the students to look because just because we the faculty knew we wanted them to look into that as well so if the students if you want to look at what sort of campaigns that you guys research that have been effective and share about that okay I guess I'll okay okay um so i kind of looked at like what I kind of remembered online. So I remembered a lot of things like on TikTok movements that um, big groups of creators were doing and stuff. And I kind of copied the ideas, at least to make my videos, I kind of copied the ideas that they used and kind of like recreated them in order to fit my, what I wanted to say to my like fellow peers. And then I like reposted them on like my story and stuff so that they reached a, um, a farther audience. Stephanie, Ashley, any thoughts on that? 
yeah just like elizabeth was talking about um i was also thinking about the whole trends thing um i did leave a comment under person about how there was this thing going on back in like 2019 with everybody buying hydro flask and like uh stopping uh single plastic use uh bottles and you know they were really supporting hydro flask as a company as one but they were supporting reusing um you know big jugs of <laughs> reusable bottles yeah reusable bottles but that's really was my perspective on it just dropping jumping on the trends and using those platforms to help um bring everybody closer together with these great right yeah i really like your use of social media to um to engage more students did that go over well did i mean you did say that you had a bunch of friends that liked one of your videos do you think that that is a good strategy for other campaigns oh uh, yeah i actually do because more of my peers nowadays aren't really hand there are some people who prefer hands-on but some of us kind of just stay home and on the phone all day so they're more they're more looking into like what videos look more interesting and then it brings their attention then they click the link look onto a website and then they start reading they're like wow that really makes sense and then they start you know um uh being active in it being aware of the yeah problem. being aware yeah. of the problem yeah. and with my friends uh i had maybe over 100 viewers on my story but then i only had 20 friends share because only 20 actually cared which comes to show who's actually paying attention to everything but you know numbers numbers will grow over time okay and, and what are the, the hottest platforms for all of you in high school is it you mentioned TikTok, you mentioned um, instagram what else Probably like TikTok and Snapchat and Instagram are probably the big three. I think Twitter a little bit, but kind of not as much. But I think TikTok's definitely the main one just because of it's like the way that it kind of makes your brain because it's constant streams of very short, entertaining like videos. So do you guys agree, Stephanie? Ashley? Yeah. Yes. Snapchat, we do. Instagram. So none of you mentioned Facebook. You guys aren't on Facebook? No, maybe just to look at my mom's stuff. <laughs> I personally have a Facebook. However, I don't really use it that much just because like not none of my friends are really on there. All right. Well, that's really valuable for us to know. Thank you. <laughs> um, so the next question that came up is about when you do put a fee on a plastic bag, how does that impact low income families? Uh, so uh, Matt, is, is that something that Ocean... Uh, or surf riders has been concerned about or has advice about yeah yeah we've we've long um supported uh giving exemptions for folks on snap and wic uh um customers who use those programs wic is women uh, infants and children and snap is um uh, nutritional assistance program so we we give those folks uh a way out and they don't have to pay the fee so that's helpful. And then we also um, always try to give out free reusable bags. So we'll get together with other groups or ourselves buy some reusable bags and just give those out for a while. Um, I was around in DC when the original uh, bag fees came out there, which is now like almost 10 years ago. And we gave out so many reusable bags. People, after a couple of months, people stopped taking them. They, were, they, they, they had enough. So those, those can be really helpful to... Um, to not put any an unnecessary burden on folks that, that don't need it. Yeah, thank you. I, I know when the uh, Virginia passed the law that said local governments can put a five cent fee on single use plastic bags, uh, they also mentioned the need to um, distribute free, re high quality reusable bags to SNAP and WIC recipients. So I think um, the, uh, the justice issue has come up a lot when we talk about putting fees on single use plastics. Um, and I think most people understand that either exemptions need to be made or uh, people need to be assisted to have those reusable bags. So any other thoughts on that, um, Britta or? I'll just say sort of in that same vein, um, sometimes the barrier for entry to having reusables is is similar you know um an option that can replace a plastic straw is a glass straw or a bamboo straw and sometimes these can 
they cost money, right? Um, so it's important to not only think about substitutions, I think, in, in our daily lives, but also like, does this item actually need a substitute? Like another option is, would be to just try going without a straw. That is free um, and that's gonna prevent plastic in the same way. So there are certainly barriers to be, to be overcome, um, but thinking about plastics, not always as something that needs to be substituted, but as something that can be eliminated uh, in terms of certain products is, is another way to go. Excellent point, excellent point. Yes, I heard somebody make a presentation once and she divided all plastics into stupid plastics or smart plastics. Uh, for example, smart plastics might include single-use plastics in a hospital situation where you have, you know, to make sure everything's very sterile. And um, but stupid plastics, she put plastic straws in that category because it's just not necessary, just not needed. Um, great, great. Yeah, and I would I would totally agree. Um, in terms of PPE, which I talked about today, like obviously disposable items like I mentioned, have been really important to, to curbing transmission of COVID. Um, plastics do have their, their place. I think the medical industry is, is one place where they're very important. Um, and that's kind of why we have not necessarily advocated for cloth masks versus disposable. Like um, it, it all depends. The landscape is constantly shifting, you know, guidelines from CDC and, and local organizations are constantly shifting as well. So we, we haven't necessarily advocated for reusable versus disposable, but um, in terms of disposables, what we are advocating for is safe disposal of them, um, as opposed to like elimination or, or going for something we don't necessarily know is, is medically as effective. Great. Um, okay, well, our next question is uh, back to the high school students and Dr. Smith. Um, we know with community-based social marketing, you often start with one behavior change and then see if you can't leverage that to do more behavior change. So the question is, are you thinking of looking at the school's dining hall or, or um, cafe to see uh, if there's single-use plastics being used there that could be either substituted or eliminated? Um, for the duration of this grant, we're working on the bottles, but um, the each of the schools has tremendous faculty that are um, representative, and I know that is something they would like to jump into, but um, there's a lot of pressures on them. I mean, not just school pressures, but to go in there and they're like, well, you don't understand water pressure. Like at one of our local high schools, it doesn't have as much water pressure as the others. So they can't effectively wash in hot water all the silverware to get it done on certain days. So then they would switch into plastic. But um, I'd love to see things like that happen for sure. Um, but again, I'm not in the high school, so I can't advocate for it. I'm. You can talk about, do your teachers suggest that? at your schools? Yeah, definitely a lot of our teachers like suggest that we kind of bring our own stuff. They say um, like they kind of don't, they don't advocate for us using the single use plastics. They would like for us to like either bring our own silverware from home for packing lunches or to not use the school or to use the like school's regular silverware. But when that's not available, I think a lot that's when a lot of kids have issues because then there's no kind of reusable option available because sometimes they use just pla like styrofoam trays and like um, and plastic silverware, which I think should kind of be the first thing to be phased out. And Stephanie, what about your school? Is there thoughts of trying to get away from some of the single use plastics? I think that freedom is definitely getting better. Um, we have uh, so, water dispensers where like yeah. these just, they're being installed and I think some of them have already been installed. So like we can reuse bottles. And Ms. D's, uh, our teacher was actually telling us how uh, she was trying to give everybody a reusable water bottle. And I feel like that would be great because for all the sport players who lose their water bottles, we kind of just throw them around. 
you know, we all have our own bottles. And I mean, we can't really lose the bottle because we'll hear when it falls. It's pretty loud. And um, since we can, uh, <laughs> we can now refill them easier with these water fountain, water fountains that are being installed. I think that would just be a, a great usage of uh, lowering um, single plastic water bottle usage. Do your high schools give disposable silverware in the cafeteria? No, no, not really. Maybe for breakfast, but I've never seen it for lunch or, or yeah. maybe field trips. But on any other occasion, I have barely seen it. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, I guess at, at this point, uh, we have to wrap it up. I so appreciate all of your time, uh, Matt, Brenna, uh, Cindy, Stephanie, Ashley, and Elizabeth. Uh, thank you so much for all that input. We are going to take a brief break, 30 minute break. We're going to show some really interesting videos uh, if you want to stay around and watch those. But it's very important, come back after the break because we're going to give each of you a special secret discount code uh, because this is Plastic Free July. Uh, and so there's a company that will uh, give you a code so you can take 10% off of a purchase of items that will help you reduce plastic uh, pollution in your own life. So again, 30 minutes, we're gonna be back here at uh, 2.45. And uh, like I say, we're gonna show some videos to keep you entertained. Uh, so thank you for being with us and see you all in half an hour. Bye-bye. <laughs>